textile worker by winter, baseball player by spring. Proud of their towns, proud of their talent. Baseball is woven into the core of Kannapolis. What kind of sport do you like? Well, baseball. Since there was a mill, there was baseball. Mills fielded teams all over the Piedmont, and games became major social events for workers and families. In 1927, longtime foes, the Concord Weavers and the Kannapolis Towelers, faced off at Webb Field. Over 7,000 people came to watch. Concessions sold out before the first pitch. A storm rolled in, ending the game and brewing fight. But not before one thing was clear. Baseball was big business in Cabarrus. Come on, American Legion Junior Star of Gastonia. A swell little pitch as we ever saw one. In the dark days of the Depression, the Carolina League sprung up, offering fans a diversion. The league thrived for a few years. In 1937, the Towlers drew 90,000 fans to their games. In 1938, the Carolina League joined the folds of professional baseball. The Towlers fought for the title in 40 and 41, but organized ball left the area soon after. The city and Cannon Mills thrived and kept playing ball, but the community was without a team again until the mid-90s. Local leaders wanted to bring baseball back to the area and convince the Phillies affiliate in Spartanburg to move north. I think that, that we were very lacking uh, uh, in the diversity of entertainment options uh, for people in uh, Kannapolis and Cabarrus and Rowan County. And this was a great opportunity to provide something for, for folks that created a sense of pride. Ready or not, professional baseball returned to Kannapolis in 1995. It wasn't everything that, uh, that, that we would like for it to have been when that first pitch was thrown out in 1995. The construction ran right up to opening day. The clubhouse uh, had not been completed yet. There were. Uh, temporary concession, I think even some temporary restroom facilities and those kind of things. Well, we had uh, porta potties. Terrible. <laughs> I mean, nobody, especially the bathrooms, nobody likes not to have a bathroom. But we survived. While fans were happy to have their team again, the Phillies moniker would last just one year. After the inaugural season, management hosted a Name the Team contest, and the Piedmont Bull Weevils won out. The miniature bug destroys cotton crops and is a small but legendary foe of both Southerners and mill owners. I love the bull weevils. I loved everything about it. I love the logo, the hats. A lot of people don't know what the bull weevil, what a bull weevil is, and we've had to explain that to people coming in from other areas as well. Unbelievable! It was, it was a great one. I think that season I remember we had the, the cards printed that the fans would would hold up over their heads that said "unbelievable," and we would answer the phones. You know, hey, Piedmont bull weevils. Hope you're having an unbelievable day. When hometown hero Dale Earnhardt bought a piece of the team in November of 2000, the team dropped its allegiance to the minute beetle and saluted Earnhardt's aggressive style, becoming the Intimidators. And Earnhardt still got the lead! Incredible! Tragically, Dale died before the Intimidators' inaugural season. The name took on even more meaning at home and across the country. Dale was always proud to tell the whole world that he was from Kannapolis, North Carolina. Saying these words many, many times, 
those folks are like me. It was pretty sad because I personally knew him and uh, and most of my family uh, knew him and everything because uh, we grew up together. Uh, I was one of those people he, he would go deer hunting and things together with. We actually hunted on this land and we play ball on right now. Yeah, it was a little bit different, of course, because people were, or they were mourning. Um, you know, he was a, a celebrity in, in the town. Yeah, they missed him. They wanted to be out there. He was taken too young, um, you know, dirt, doing what he loves, but but racing hard like, like he always did. In July 2003, the community faced another crushing blow. The mill closed leaving over 4,300 unemployed. It's, it's really devastating, you know, because especially for the people who have put <laughs> even five or 10 years, but for all of us that have been with the company for, you know, 25, 27, 30 years, it, it's, it's very emotional. Sad, most people still didn't believe it. It, it, was, it was like it's happening and, and it was, uh, it's just like most people think uh, it's not it's not supposed to happen citizens who came to us and said you know i've never worked any place but the mill my family worked at the mill my grandparents worked at the mill i don't know anything but working at the mill what am i going to do with my life through it all baseball remained a constant during that time when, when we did go through some challenging periods with the closing of the mill and those, those kind of events, and of course the Great Recession, uh, that was an affordable entertainment option for folks that allowed families to get out of the house and sort of escape from the everyday worries uh, that, that were prevalent during that time period, and, and that made those games even more special. Year after year, the cannon was home to more than just baseball. Strangers became friends that seemed like family. It's like uh, we have a, a five month family reunion starting from April until August every year and it's something that I'll never forget. I've, I've made lots of friends here, friends that I never would have made if I weren't here at the ball park. Romances blossomed and turned into actual families. I met my wife down here in uh, 1995, first, thing, first season we had a team, sold peanuts throughout the stands. Uh, two years after we met, we ended up getting married, having kids. Uh, that changed my life completely. Our favorite memory is from August of 98 when I met my husband. This was our summer job after high school in the concession stand and he was my runner as I did the cash register. So my wife and I got engaged at home plate in the state. New Year's Eve 2002. Our first date was to a Durham Bulls game. And so uh, it was a baseball thing from the very beginning. Players earned their stripes here, launching not just homers, but careers. You know, I got a lot of positive memories. Uh, it was my first year in professional baseball, just after I'd signed out of college. Um, and it just so happened that I rolled into a pretty good team, and we were able to, to make the playoffs and win the championships. You know, being a player and now in the front office with the White Sox, a lot of, a lot of great memories. To me, a lot of it, the, the front office people in general, the, what they do on the field is, is, is not as important as what they do in our community. Good players like Jimmy Rollins, who is an all-star player from Philadelphia Phillies that started right here. In 2005, victory. The Intimidators won the league championships. We were, you know, fairly mediocre team throughout the season, and we came together in the playoffs and really gelled and and just had a really good playoff run. And, yeah, and then when it happened, it was like, you know, because we never had any kind of anything like this in Kanapas before. We went back to the clubhouse and, and we were just obviously in good spirits and um, you know, we, we were, you know, it was kind of one of those, we just won, this is extremely long, we've never experienced this and we're almost close to the off season as well. So uh, it's good times. Just after winning the title, the city lost its iconic mill buildings. The buildings were demolished to pave way for the North Carolina Research Campus and a new downtown vision. It was tough, but in spite of it being that tough, 
Citizens of Kannapolis have been tough all along and have grown through this and have now positioned themselves to say, we're not that community we used to be. We're going to grow into a new community. It was a sad day, it was an end of an era. You know, the Cannon family really built this community, started it from nothing, and created loads and loads of jobs for years and years and years. It was the economic engine. While the Intimidators played ball, city leaders planned. In 2015, the city bought nearly 50 acres of its own downtown and embarked on an ambitious plan. It was an exciting time, but a, sort of a sad time too. We had uh, the research campus that was trying to get its feet under it, and they were having difficulty recruiting researchers to come to the campus because there was nothing for the family to do at downtown. So we said, well, Mr. Burdock, you have to do something about that. You have to renovate it, revitalize it or something. And he said, no, all of my money is invested in the research campus. All my estate is going to be involved with research campus. Uh, somebody else is going to have to do it. And I said to him, well, Mr. Murdoch, if you are not going to do it, then we have to do it. And I said, so why don't you sell it to me? Cities are known to buy a building or a block, but never an entire downtown. And that's exactly what we did. It was a very bold decision. What we needed to do was take control of our own destiny, and we have done that. Those plans centered around a downtown sports and entertainment venue. We needed something to bring people downtown, so we called them anchors. We focused on a ballpark because um, it really was the one that would attract private development. City officials and planners spent two years crafting a downtown vision. Meanwhile, ownership changes brought a new face to the area, to Meridy Baseball's Andy Sandler. It was the perfect confluence of circumstances. We were looking to invest in a minor league team especially where there was the opportunity to do development. My phone rang one day, asked if I was interested in investing in this team. It was perfect. Great partners. We decided to do it. While Bart Mallow and Wayne Brothers started to build the ballpark, the team looked to rebuild the Intimidator's brand. Sandler discovered some challenges. Well, we got here, we talked to people in the community, we learned that we really don't control that brand. It's hard to do the things you need to do when you don't have ownership of a brand. A lot of fans were angry when the team announced it was looking for a new name. I guess probably the nicest way I could put it would be we were pretty upset. I mean, we were, especially me and all of us were Earnhardt fans. That's what kind of drew us to baseball. You know, we've been the Intimidators for so long and it's kind of like it's taken a part of us away. Nobody likes change. I don't know, I think it's taken away from tradition a little bit. He was from here, that's why everybody loved the Intimidators, still love it, and really upset that they're changing it. Oh my goodness, that was my first reaction. Uh, don't like to change the name of the team because we had a lot of people who were invested in that name. We heard a lot of curse words, no doubt about it, whether it was written on paper, whether it was posted on the new ballpark site, whether it was on Twitter, Facebook, over the phone, uh, via email. There were definitely a lot of people that weren't happy uh, with the name change. Anger turned into action, and more than a thousand people submitted ideas, some more serious than others. Um, the cannons. Canapolis possums. I'd like to see it still have Canapolis in it. Something exciting, futuristic, maybe a, a catchy. Something that has to do with cannon mills, because that's where it all started. Uh, names like the possums, the kangaroos, the unicorns, just crazy kooky things like that. Uh, the Phoenix was a great original name because of Kannapolis history where it kind of went through some turmoil in the early 2000s and it was a city kind of rising from the ashes. The club hired designer Dan Simon to help create their new identity. Simons helped teams create memorable and meaningful marks for 25 years. He's also seen his share of disappointed supporters. When a team decides that they are going to rebrand and then they announce that, it's usually met with resistance. People don't like change. People are comfortable with what they already know. Simon visited Kannapolis to get a feel for the city. He asked a lot of questions. 
and did even more listening. There were two things that really stood out to me regarding the, everybody that I met. One of them was how helpful all the people were. They just wanted to know what can we do to help with this process. Uh, to the extent that I met with a businessman at, at his business and I started asking him some specific questions. And the next thing I know, he just says, well, I'm gonna take you and show you. And we got in his truck and he took me around, around the city. The other thing was everybody without exception was excited about the future of baseball in Kannapolis. Then the hard part started, taking so many ideas and turning them into an identity. The team had some ground rules. To listen to the community, see what it is that the community wanted in, its, in the name of the team. That was principle one, principle two, and principle three. Is it local? Is it unique? And is it fun? And if it wasn't all three of those, we had to scrap it. We went through a lot of really good and really bad ideas because they didn't hit those three tenets. They also knew what was important to fans. I think it had to be creative, one of a kind, but also connect with the local area, connect with Kannapolis, connect with the history, still have connections with Dale Earnhardt. I don't want any of these weird names. Not have some weird thing that doesn't reflect anything with Kannapolis or have anything to do with this area, Cabarrus County. A branding that gives Kannapolis a, a strong background, a, 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 a solidarity to a community that's strong. Dan kept asking questions, learning about the area. Along with creative partner Peter Thornburg, he conceptualized potential names. Ideas and rough sketches flew back and forth from Washington, D.C. to Kannapolis to Dan's studio in Louisville, Kentucky. Ten preliminary ideas were whittled down to three viable identities that tried to hit all the right notes. How do we honor and respect Dale Earnhardt without showing Dale specifically? How do we create a character that appeals to both men and women, people young and old, and in between, uh, baseball fans and casual fans, and people who are not necessarily baseball fans yet. Then, Dan sketched some more. How do we bring this otherwise amorphous idea to life and make it real and, and have all these details that make it perfect? Does it have stars? Does it not? Does it have a number? All those details to, to bring this character to life. Well, I can remember a meeting where we were talking about a lot of different names and again, we were looking at it against what suggestions we got from the community and Dan Simon presented us with a mascot and lettering and the whole branding and we looked at each other and we said, this is the one. Ladies and gentlemen, light the fuse, get excited, you are going to have a blast with the Kannapolis Cannonballers. <laughs>